Hi everyone, I'm Barry Hensley with another episode of The Foundation Guy. And in today's episode, we're gonna be talking about soil. And uh, I, I tell you, I've been building for a long time and it, not a year goes by that I don't learn something about soil that I didn't know in the past. So there's a lot to talk about. And to help us uh, with that today, we've got a guest with us, uh, Jordan Ray with Arctic Engineering. Uh, he's a structural engineer in the Dallas, Texas area. And uh, we're going to be letting Jordan explain to us uh, what soil is all about, good soil, bad soil, you know, things of that nature. And uh, so, Jordan, welcome to the show. I'm glad you're here. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, yeah, just some background on me. I'm a structural engineer. Uh, I've been practicing primarily in Texas. Um, and a lot of uh, residential type structures is kind of the bread and butter. Uh, but I've also done some commercial and healthcare projects as well. Um, but yeah, some background on me. Uh, I have a bachelor's and master's degree uh, in civil engineering. My master's, I focused on structural engineering uh, out at UT Tyler. And uh, I've been in business for myself since 2014. And I uh, have gotten a lot of experience over the years of different types of soil, uh, whether it's in North Texas um, or the Austin area, as well as San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So a lot of interesting and varied soils in uh, Texas that we have to work with. So. Yeah, and we're we're here in the in the Dallas area at the mm -hmm. Dallas On Air Studios, and thanks to Dallas On Air for letting us use their studio for this podcast. And, but uh, soil problems aren't just in this area, are they? No, they're everywhere. Uh, just depends on on where you are and what you're dealing with. So I, I remember looking uh, a few days ago, I was looking at a map. I think it came from the U.S. Geological Survey. It talks about different soil types. And and uh, the blue or the green or something on there was what they call the bad soil. And it pretty much goes everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, generally, uh, North Texas is considered difficult soils to deal with for construction. So there's a lot of uh, interesting soil types here that pose some challenges when we're designing and, and constructing new buildings. Yeah. So, you know, I hear I hear the term tossed around from time to time, good soil, bad soil. Um, I'm sure as a structural engineer, that means something to you. For me as a builder, uh, all I need to know is that my engineer did the right thing. You know, just <laughs> give, give me the right foundation. Um, so the soil, though, is something that you have to consider uh, in your profession. So, you know, I, I, let's explain what, what is bad soil? What is good soil? What do we mean by those terms? Yeah, those are kind of loose terms to use. <clears throat> Generally, uh, it all relates back to dollars. So when you, people say bad soil, it generally means that you have to spend a lot of money uh, fixing the soil or making it more adequate for the type of building you're putting in. Up here in North Texas, generally it means expansive clay soil. That's the the typical bad soil that you deal with here. It's just difficult to deal with because it's uh, very highly plastic clays generally that swell and contract a large amount with moisture variation. So um, we have to overcome those challenges because that imposes a lot of uh, stresses on a, a building when you have soils that will swell and, and shrink a lot with moisture. And it, the, soils, the soil moves around and that's not a good thing. That's right. Yeah. So if you're putting a foundation on this soil, uh, it has the potential to to heave and settle quite a bit, which can cause a lot of damage to a building. And so we have to anticipate that movement and figure out how to how to deal with it. Yeah. So you know, I I, I originally, it, as a builder, I've been building forty years, and as a builder, I've I've made myself a mental note to ask you, you know, what, why do I care? I mean, it's good soil, it's bad soil. You're the structural engineer. You're, you're the one who has to make these decisions as a builder. Why, why do I care? Why should I care whether my soil is good soil or bad soil? Uh, well, it just, it's going to greatly impact the long-term sustainability of your project. Um, it's going to also really impact the cost of the project. So now that, now that, that would mean something to me right there. When you start <laughs> right. talking about cost, I'm going to start looking for, you know, what's what's the most economical solution right. that I can do. Um, and I guess what you're about to tell me is bad soil is going to cost me more to build on. Is that right? Yeah, generally. So everything seems to come back to numbers in the construction world. So, you know, the less you have to spend on things that, you know, you'd rather not invest in, the better. So you have to kind of balance uh, long-term risk of uh, – having to maintain or repair 
a structure with the upfront costs of it as well and uh, come up with a generally builders need to compromise at some point uh, because the most ideal solution is the most expensive typically and so uh, and often unaffordable for the project so it could it could make or break a whole project um, and so that'll determine whether or not you can even do the project and so a lot of times you have to come up with solutions that will achieve the goals and, and performance uh, standards that you're looking for, but also meet the budgets that you're, you're setting and, and that need to be made for the project to be successful. So there could be some soil that's bad enough, if I could use that term, that mm -hmm. the cost to build on it would be prohibitive. Yes. It could blow the budget. Yeah, that's correct. Interesting. So if I'm, you know, if I'm, if I'm about to build, if I'm going to do a project and I'm about to build, and of course I've, I've got the information that I need to give you about the soil, uh, that's called a geotechnical report that I would provide to you to do the engineering for me. Mm -hmm. um, can that bad soil be made into good soil? Uh, so there's several methods. One would be remove and replace with what we call select fill, which is take out all the soil that's giving you heartburn bring in some new soil to replace it with, compact it, and then use that as your bearing layer for the, the structure to sit on. Another, so what did you call that, that new soil? Uh, select fill. Select fill. So that's going to be some kind of soil that would fall into the good soil category. Yes, exactly. And it's like ideal soil. Does that, does that, does that have to be, is that, a, is that like a composition that has to be put together somewhere or does it, is it dug out of the ground somewhere as good soil or how do we get our hands on that? Yeah, so generally it's, it's other areas where, you know, you're borrowing from other places that the soil is, is better. And the geotech report will generally outline what defines that select fill. So it'll have uh, certain parameters uh, that are conducive to being, you know, used on the site. So you'll have um, a select fill will generally not be as expansive. So they'll give you some range. You don't want any like organic materials in there. You don't want a lot of different uh, large pieces of rock in there or anything like that. You want it to be pretty well graded soil that uh, is easier to compact, uh, is stable, you know, and it has a decent bearing capacity on it yeah. as well. If I were to call somebody up and ask them for select fill, they'd know what I'm talking about. Yes. Okay. And the geotech is going to have some parameters in there about what that soil, what the characteristics of that soil should be. Yes, and generally they'll also inspect uh, that soil as it's brought to the site and make sure it meets those standards. Oh, somebody's going to come on site and see. Typically, how, you will. Yeah, I got you. From the geotech firm. Yeah. So that's one way to fix bad soil or turn bad soil into good soil. What else could we do to it? Uh, another really common method is called moisture conditioning. So uh, kind of the principle behind that is going to be you have clay soils that react to moisture uh, in, in a way of they, they expand to, with moisture. When they dry out, they contract a lot. And so what moisture conditioning is, is you go in and pull out all of the soil and rework it, but you rework it with moisture in there and uh, what we call pre-saturating the soils. Mm -hmm. So we'll saturate those soils and basically pre-swell them. So it's kind of using the, the nature of the soil to your advantage because you know it's going to expand with moisture. And so instead of letting it expand with moisture, you go ahead and just swell it all the way and, and saturate it. Bring it back in to the site, compact it in place, and then you'll put a moisture barrier around it to keep the moisture from migrating as easily away from it. And so you, the idea is to lock in that moisture in there so that you don't have soil that expands and contracts with weather changes. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's already pre-swelled and hopefully will stay at that um, amount of swell permanently. And then I've heard uh, people use a, something called chemical injection. What does that do? It changes the chemistry of the um, soil itself. So the expansive clays when you inject them with these chemicals, it uh, has a chemical reaction that deactivates that plasticity of it and essentially turns that soil into um, less plastic soils that's easier to work with, that won't expand anymore. And so you can reduce the amount of, of expansion and contraction of those soils mm -hmm. by chemically altering them with uh, by introducing a new chemical into them. Okay, and and I, I know people will shy away from the word chemical. I mean, we live in a 
in a world where environmental stewardship is a big thing and all that, are those chemicals harmful? You My know, understanding is no, they're not. Uh, it's chemicals, but uh, and, you know everything's chemicals, really, if you think about it. Uh, I'd have to look up the exact chemicals they use, but yeah. uh, but no, they're they're safe to use there. Oh, that's and good. They don't contaminate the they water supply. They don't contaminate the soil like or the water supply or anything. Right. Yeah, that's good. That's good to know. So I've heard you use the word plastic a few times. Mm -hmm. When I think of plastic, you know, I think of a red solo cup or something <laughs> like that. But yeah. what does it mean when, you, when you're talking about soil? What does plastic mean? So um, from an engineering perspective, it's going to be soils that, so like if you go out and you pick up some sand in your hands, it's going to fall apart, pull away from each other, and all the granules will kind of separate. Um, but with a plastic soil that's a, like a clay, it's going to be, um, you know, the texture of it's going to be something that kind of pulls and sticks and be kind of sticky and can and pliable. You can pull it apart really well. And so there's some standard testing that the geotechs use uh, called Atterberg limits. And so what they do is they go in and, and actually apply moisture to the soil and perform these lab tests by saturating them all the way and seeing how much uh, saturation they can take. So it's almost like a measurement of how much moisture can you put in there. And then they also will go and dry them out and say, how dry can the soil get? Mm -hmm. And the plasticity of it is kind of a measurement of those extremes. Is that is that one of the numbers that helps you determine how much that soil could move? Yeah. So one of the tests is a, um, it's going to be a liquid limit test. So that's kind of how much water it can take, how much saturation the soils can take. Um, and then uh, you have a, a plastic limit test as well. And uh, you come up with some numbers, you follow these ASTM guidelines on these tests. And uh, the difference between those two numbers, the plasticity uh, index is what you come up with. So mm -hmm. the liquid limit minus the uh, plastic limit, you get a uh, plasticity index there. And so that number, it's kind of a unitless number, but it kind of gives you an indicator of how expansive are the soils? How plastic are they? Yeah. And I'm assuming on a scale of whatever, a higher number would be worse than a lower number. Would that be? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So since it's the difference between those two numbers, uh, the bigger that difference, the more plasticity in the soils there. So I got you. You know, some, some soils, well, they, they use a thing called PVR. I've, I've heard that term before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that I think there's a, a clause in the post-tension guideline that says you can't build a post-tension foundation if the PVR is higher than 4.5. Right. So what is PVR and how do we come up with that number? Uh, so the PVR is an estimate of, it's, it's based on PVM. So PVM stands for potential vertical movement mm -hmm. uh, of the soils. And mm -hmm. so what you're trying to anticipate is uh, something that the, the plasticity index won't give you is how much vertical uh, movement can you anticipate with these soils from like a very dry condition to a very wet condition. So mm -hmm. you kind of think about what's the worst part of year of the year that's very really dry. So the summertime might be super dry. These soils dry out and so they'll shrink quite a bit. And then what's a very uh, wet time of the year for the area you're in. And that will that measurement will give you how much potential vertical rise PVR you'll get in the soils. And that'll kind of just anticipate it. Get, it's kind of a barometer on how much movement you can expect to see from the soils. So that, that gives me a, another indication of whether I have bad soil or good soil. That's correct. Yeah. So you'll be able to know uh, if I put a slab or a foundation on, on this soil, how much movement can I expect being induced on the slab from the soil itself. Yeah. So I, I guess, so if, as, a, as a builder, if I'm going to build on bad soil or, you know, let's, let's say relatively bad soil, mm -hmm. is there a foundation? I mean, you as a structural engineer, can you design a foundation that will withstand whatever that movement is? Or do we always have to reduce that potential movement somewhat? You can... You can design around the soils. Um, you're talking about without any soil remediation, basically. Can you 
uh, can you design for the soil without okay you, you use the term soil remediation that that's the that's how you fix bad soil make it into right. good soil right okay. the foundation has to be able to withstand that movement right is right. that what your job is to make a foundation that will withstand that movement yeah so any foundation that's actually going to be bearing on those soils you have to design it to withstand kind of the expected movement of those soils yeah um, and the only other way beyond doing it that way is to actually elevate the slab and suspend it on piers so that it's no longer being affected by the movement of the soils. Mm -hmm. It can actually sit above the soil with that type of foundation method. Yeah, that probably gets expensive. Right. So that, that gets back to then as a builder deciding, do I want to spend my money fixing the soil or do I want to put this really expensive foundation in? Right, right. Either way, if I got bad soil, I'm going to spend some money somewhere, right? Right, yeah. And you yeah. mentioned that the PTI, the Post Tensioning Institute uh, manual, or the code for slabs on grade, uh, it general guidelines there are that a slab on grade can withstand <clears throat> up to four and a half inches of PVR before you have to start looking at alternatives uh, like suspending the slab or remediating the soil. And uh, that's the kind of a general guideline. So you can look at a geotech report, see the PVR, and if it's a five or six inch PVR, you can know that you're kind of outside that zone and you might need to bring in some other options beyond just building a robust slab. Yeah. And when you mention uh, slab on grade, that, that's that's most of the houses and small buildings mm -hmm. are built that way, right? Yes. Okay. So that's where we see somebody that uh, grades a lot and then comes out with a trencher and cuts a trench about every 10 to 12 feet. Right. And then they put in the post tension cables. Right. And pour the concrete. And so you wind up with a, uh, I guess a four or four and a half inch thick slab supported by these beams that are where the concrete's poured into the trenches. Yes. That's what you call slab on grade. hundred percent of the slab is on the ground. That's right. Yeah. It's on, sits on grade. And especially here in North Texas, especially in residential construction, you have, uh, they call that like a waffle slab, a waffle type of slab. So, yeah. uh, it's the system of a perimeter deep in grade beam. And then you just have a grid in both directions. Like you said, every 10, 12 feet typically, gotcha of deeper grade beams that are usually about 10 to 12 inches wide, maybe 28 <clears throat> to 36 inches deep. And then in between those beams, you have uh, a thin slab that's four to five inches. And yeah. uh, and so you just kind of have this waffle look to it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because um, the slab is supposed to be able to withstand that movement. Are, are we really going to get, you know, let's say the PVR is like you said, 4.5. Mm -hmm. Are we really going to get that much movement out of that soil? Yeah. So I think the idea is that potentially yeah. you could get that movement. Yeah. Whether or not you get it in reality depends on a lot of things. Uh, the biggest one it would be the, the weather changes. So, you know, maybe if you went through a few years of a very bad drought and then all of a sudden had a, a year or two of extremely wet weather, you might see those extremes. But it is kind of an estimate based on the most extreme uh, potential for dryness or wetness of that soil. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I really appreciate the information. I hope our, our viewers have enjoyed this this episode. Have you got anything else you want to add before we wrap this one up? Uh, no, that kind of covers it. I appreciate you having me on and, and bet. really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks for taking the time. I do, I do want to mention before we go that uh, this episode uh, is brought to you by a company called Waffle Mat. They're the sponsor of this episode. And WaffleMat is the leading foundation system for single-family, multi-family, and light commercial structures built on expansive, rocky, compressible, or liquefiable soils. Over 30 million square feet of WaffleMat foundations have been installed across the USA since its introduction in 1993. WaffleMat not only delivers superior performance when compared to other foundation systems, but additionally delivers significant cost savings by reducing soil prep and building cycle times. And I also want to thank the foundation guy for letting us put this podcast on uh, on the YouTube channel out there. And uh, we've enjoyed it. Jordan, thank you. We'll have you back for another episode. And I really enjoyed having you here. Appreciate your participation. Sounds great. Looking forward to the next one. You bet. The views, information, and or opinions expressed during this recording are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of SmartSense Structural Systems and its assigns.